Hello, Energy Physics here, and I'm uh, going to present the second in a series of quantum uh, lectures and um, quantum field theory and gravity theory that I've been working on since uh, 2012 and documented in manuscripts that are available on the internet through Amazon, mhatcher.com. Basically, they start with uh, how to understand quantum field theory, how to understand gravity, how to understand Newtonian physics, uh, those types of titles. So if you're interested in more detailed uh, analysis on the theory that I've been developing um, to try to improve on the general relativity theories and the current quantum field theory as it stands for the standard model, um, neither of those two theories are compatible uh, they're good approximations. There's nothing wrong with them. In fact, they're fantastically beautiful theories, but they're not answering certain questions that are existing and coming into view with dark energy, dark matter, uh, physics at the Planck scale, uh, what is a Planck star, and uh, certain things like Cherenkov radiation and Casimir effect. Um, the theory of developing is a good approach to answering and solving those questions with particle interaction at the Planck scale. The uh, theories are speculative. I've submitted eight papers uh, to the APS Society that have been uh, rejected primarily because of the statement that they're too speculative, not because they're wrong, but they would invalidate about 80 percent of the uh, work that's been done in the last 20 to 40 years by gravity theorists and uh, they're the ones that are the gatekeepers of the current APS uh, board. So when I realized they're not going to be published, I uh, published those eight papers in uh, my most recent book uh, manuscript so that if you're interested in reading those papers, uh, they're available as well. Uh, the theories and the lecture series I'm presenting uh, are overviews. They're not the mathematical detail that I'd like to have, but because uh, that gets really boring. But I'm trying to get across uh, concepts for uh, what might be new ways of approaching and solving this problem. Uh, pretty confident that uh, they can shed some light on the, the reality of physics rather than the fantasy of physics, which is happening now, uh, with uh, mathematics guiding our assumptions and it's misleading us uh, into wild speculations and fantasies like wormholes and quantum entanglement and you know time travel and you know human beings can go through black holes and you know other bullshit that you can't even survive the gamma radiation anywhere close to those so physicists are using too many analogies and not enough focus on the actual particles themselves when you go take a physics course at college, it's all about analogies of railroads and trains and elevators and other junk that doesn't help you conceptualize what's really going on with the quantum-sized particles themselves. So this is a particle-only theory, which is why it's controversial. Um, it eliminates uh, wave concepts because they're not necessary. Uh, it can calculate the same numbers using frequency without wavelengths simply by having a point type particle, solid mass particle, with an angular spin velocity that rotates and travels at the speed of light, but rotates at quantized frequencies, that those quantized frequencies are exactly equal to the same types of uh, composites uh, and free frequency and wavelength calculations that give us the spectrum, full spectrum of radiation and light, radio, gamma, microwave theory. So I'm just looking at that from a different perspective. It's not a wave, it's actually just a spinning object with a angular spin velocity that is the frequency. That angular spin velocity is quantized. It only exists at a certain value coming out of the electron, in the case of the photon quantum. And uh, it has a specific energy level described by Planck's constant. And the addition of uh, this theory, I add gravity to it, which is again using the same concept and structure that photon quantum and the smallest possible fermion in the universe, which I call a mass quantum, those are the two basic uh, fundamental particles formed at the very beginning of the universe that form all the other particles of the standard model. They're just composites that build up in bound states and free states interacting with each other to create all that we know. And that's a pretty solid uh, approach to understanding how 
Photons get captured inside of electrons and change state. They don't disappear. They can't be destroyed. They're indestructible. But the energy levels can be transferred back and forth between mass and energy. So the mass quantum and the photon quantum can form sort of a particle or antiparticle pair uh, as they interact between bound and free states. The problem is uh, our modern sensors can't detect the missing mass of dark energy and dark matter, and that is the mass quantum that is causing gravity. And when we measure that in a particle accelerator as it gets blasted out, just like photon quantum do, uh, we, we don't detect it. It becomes missing mass. And this is the reason why we've been searching for a Higgs particle explanation, which is really a composite of multiple quarks and um, other particles that decay eventually uh, into basic particles of the standard model. Um, and we never measure the mass quantum uh, it particle itself. The only evidence of the mass quantum is the LIGO experiments that have come in from two neutron stars colliding, and those are very hot uh, inbound particle streams of the smallest particles in the universe traveling the distance that they need to travel. Uh, they're not waves, and we need to reinterpret that data uh, as a particle stream uh, interacting with the photons, the electrons, the protons, and the neutrons, and the neutrinos inside of that steel bar, causing it to vibrate and change the uh, output of the interferometers that are on each end of it. So uh, that's a quick summary of the, the theory. I, I try to do a quick summary in each of these lectures before I get into the slide presentations, uh, just so you can make a decision whether you want to continue <laughs> to listen to a, a long lecture or uh, move on and try to understand a different, uh, more entertaining uh, subject. Uh, but I am making the assumption that a lot of you out there that are looking at this are interested in physics and just as frustrated as I am uh, with all the fantasy and the lies and the deceit that is going on that are being presented to you by professors who are claiming weird stuff like alternative worlds and stuff that you just makes no conceptual sense at all from the human perspective because that's not our experience. It's just their assumptions that the mathematics is true when it's not. It's just a representation and a model that is being used in too heavily to create these worlds of fantasy with no evidence, uh, no particle evidence at all. So I'm focusing on the particle theory evidence that's there. Everything that we've measured in particle accelerators always turns out to be a particle. We never see a wave come out of objects. Everything that flies out of a proton or a neutron that we Im impact in a particle accelerator always comes out uh, as a stream of particles. And you can see that uh, you know, in various types of particle capture uh, devices um, and this bullshit of you know quantum states existing uh, as a wave function in front of that is just a mathematical representation that helps you get to collapsing the wave function to a single point um, and it's just uh, it's just again it's a theory that hasn't had uh, a, a good process of thinking about uh, why would we want to get rid of waves and the problem has always been that a particle stream of a, of a bunch of particles together, group particles, uh, when they stream out, they, they have fluctuations and, and they impact a, over a composite picture of time. And because they're coming out at specific um, angles and specific um, statistically, uh, un, you know, statistically uh, matching uh, different possibilities of energies and different possibilities of scattering angles. When they hit various targets, uh, they build up in white areas uh, or, or areas that are bright, and then they also have areas of dark, so you get this series of dark line, bright, white line, dark line, bright line, dark line, and that's made as an assumption that that's a wave, and, which it's not. It's just that particles all clump together and over time, you see them hitting the same area with the same scattering angle, even if they don't have the same energy. Uh, and then in the black areas, there's just no particles that hit that. So that phenomenon is a crystal lattice function. It's a group phenomenon, and it doesn't occur with single particle interaction. So this theory is about solving the single particle interaction at the Planck scale and how that supersums in energy Lagrangians to equal the same numbers that we get when we calculate with the quantum field theory or we calculate with the general relativity. It's possible to get the exact same numbers 
just a different interpretation of reality and I think it's the correct one. Uh, we just need to find the evidence that these mass quantum exist. And right now I've estimated they have a, a mass of about 10 to the minus uh, 57 and a size somewhere around uh, 10 to the minus 75 meters and that's just way below our existing detectors ability to detect. So it may be a while uh, before this theory is, uh, is validated. Uh, but it certainly, uh, in my opinion, what looking at everything out there is the most likely way that nature actually works particle only interacting at the Planck scale so let's start this lecture uh, give me a second and I'll transition to the slideshow and uh, we'll review all this uh, stuff that uh, I've just summarized in a little more detail so Modern physics today in the standard model has only been able to break apart the particles of the standard model by slamming two electrons together or two protons together or two neutrons together with high energy levels uh, created by magnetic fields which are photons in flying between the electrons and the protons in magnets. And so the photons create those magnetic fields and when the photons interact with the other particles of the standard model depending on the direction of their angular spin velocity, photons are polarized, they can spin one way or the other way, they'll change the curvature of the direction in which these particles swing. So in an electron beam you get electrons swinging uh, one way because the magnetic field of the photons are all polarized and swinging it one way in its interaction. Uh, the positron goes the opposite direction in that same particle accelerator, so you would need a different uh, track uh, if you were going to basically slam positrons together. And then you have the same thing happening with protons that are all positive. They all swing in one curve and uh, the any particle of the proton would swing in the other. And that's simply because the particles uh, spin in different directions, they have polarity, and when they interact with photons that spin in different directions, they go in opposite directions. And at really high energy levels, these are called particle-antiparticle pairs because they can, uh, very high energies, transition between pure photon quantum and convert pure mass to pure photons. And that mass that's being converted is the missing mass of the mass quantum that interacts with the photon quantum down at the Planck scale. That's new physics described by this concept. But currently, we only go as small as the quark. The quarks basically are in triplets. Uh, there are eight of them, uh, gluons that hold them together, and uh, the quark pairs uh, are uh, uh, up and down, and then there's another three pairs, uh, charm, beauty, uh, top, bottom. I think that's it uh, from what I can remember. Uh, but they're glued together by gluons, and gluons pretty much function just like photons do. Photon quantums are force carriers for the electromagnetic force. Gluons are for the strong force, and then the weak force carriers are the W plus, W minus, and Z neutral currents. And they, again, are all called bosons because they're force carriers, and they have spins that are identical, which are quantized statistical spins, not the angular velocity spins that I'm talking about. Um, there's a way of, of determining the, uh, uh, the particle types by the number, spin number, that is calculated in the quantum uh, mathematical uh, metrics theories. It's basically tensor theories and special unitary matrices manipulation. So this theory is basically saying a little bit beyond down to the Planck scale, the quark itself as a fermion, uh, it forms fermions, which are the all the mar particles of mass, all of them having the same or similar spins. Um, the quark is actually composed of, of the photon quantum and a mass quantum combination inside. And that's a new speculative theory uh, that basically uh, goes back to the Big Bang where photon quantum came into existence and mass quantum came into existence and they couldn't form solid particles so they formed these particle and antiparticle pairs until freeze out and the universe gets cold enough for them to form solid particles and of course the first particles they probably formed were quarks. Uh, that were fermion bases and then the quarks combine through gravity and the nuclear force, strong force, uh, and we'll describe what we think that force is, uh, which is um, pretty much an, a collision type of a force 
caused by dark matter uh, phenomenon, and any force that splits them apart is uh, typically uh, the same type of photon quantum mass quantum interaction that uh, forms the basis of dark energy, the accelerating expansion of the universe. So we'll try to explain this uh, screening type phenomenon that creates force inertias and gravity inertias and gravity accelerations um, and uh, force accelerations that are almost identical, uh, simply just have different particle type interactions, either photon quantum or mass quantum. So the theory is, it's not just quarks, but the photon quantum and what I call the smallest possible mass in the universe as mass quantum are the two most important particles in the universe because they form uh, through composite structures, all the other particles of the standard model. Um, and we're using this to understand the physics by understanding how these two particles interact from a Planck scale perspective. So we've asked the question before, you saw in a previous lecture, what is reality? Uh, hopefully I gave you a, you know, a fairly good uh, feel for how we have to answer this question first and why it's... Uh, a very difficult human concept to grasp. But basically, uh, once these particles come into existence, and we'll go backwards here in a minute, uh, they interact. And so we have these two particles now that we're theorizing, uh, the mass quantum particles, which are the little red dots, and the photon quantum particles, which are the big blue, uh, blue masses there. And uh, we're actually assigning a very, very small mass to the photon. Uh, simply because this theory prohibits zeros and prohibits infinities. It's a discrete mathematics uh, simply because of the assumption that uh, you can't have zeros and infinities in real physics. For things to exist, they have to have a finite size and they have to have uh, some limit on how big or how small they can be. And uh, our mathematics goes beyond that and extends beyond that into zeros and infinities, uh, making it an inaccurate form of math to use. So the right math to use is discrete mathematics. We've chosen the super summation of energy Lagrangians, which basically sum up all the energy levels created by these particles. And those energies are the same types of energies that Planck predicted in his formulations, where the summation of the energy is equal to H dot uh, times the frequency, which we're calling angular spin velocity in this case, because it's the same number. Um, and uh, then we sum that with, or plus or minus that, with a G dot, which is a gravity equivalent to Planck's constant, but it's much, much smaller, uh, somewhere around 10 to the minus 57 and 10 to the minus, uh, I think, what, 31 or something, that the Planck's con 16. Uh, we'll get that number later. Um, so we tried to create this concept that the mass quantum being very, very, very smaller than the photon quantum can interact and basically shove it around. Every impact creates a change in velocity, a change in momentum, a change in acceleration potential. And the gravity phenomenon occurs because the halo of these mass particles created at the beginning of the universe that are still out there in the form of dark matter, impacting everything, shoving everything into supernovas and stars and Planck stars and neutron stars and galaxy threads and you know Planck stars at the center of every galaxy there's billions and billions and billions of these little mass quantum are responsible for doing that let me go back here for a second I inadvertently hit that one more and um, so they impact the photon quantum uh, the same way from one direction in larger numbers than the ones on the bottom that are coming through some solid mass of fermions that are in bound state, mass quantum that are in bound states, uh, delay and filter and absorb through this uh, theory I have called a CAE theory, collision, uh, uh, absorption, and emission. They're actually trapped for a period of time and then re-emitted in the electrons and the photons and the pro I mean the electrons and the protons that are in the molecules of these uh, fermions that are in the mass of the Earth, for example. So this imbalance uh, between the number of particles, of mass quantum particles that go through the Earth versus the number that come down from above the Earth uh, from all directions, almost homogeneously in a big halo, um, that, that uh, numerical imbalance and energy imbalance uh, causes the 
a force direction toward the center of the mass that's screening the particles uh, from getting through. And that creates motion in the direction of the center of that mass object. That is gravity. Photons can do the same thing and create photon inertia um, that we can experiment with and actually do an experiment where we push uh, masses around, we push the electrons around and using photons and if we imbalance the number of them impacting on one side with uh, screening photons on the other through some filter then the object will move in the direction of that in a, in a vacuum situation or, or non-gravity situation uh, and create uh, what looks like gravity but it's actually inertia and force caused by photons. So they're almost indistinguishable in terms of their behaviors with the exception of Cherenkov radiation and Casimir effect. Um, Cherenkov radiation is a phenomenon that where we observe as the photon approaches the speed of light uh, in a particle accelerator, um, as the particles, protons and electrons, approach the speed of light, they emit photons. Um, and you see those photons as bright, I think, blue flashes of light. Uh, whereas in a gravity well, um, you don't see those photons as the particles approach the speed of light. Uh, there is no Cherenkov radiation, and that's been an enigma for a long time. Well, the reason for that is the thing that's doing the pushing in the gravity well is the mass quantum. That's that missing mass that we can't detect. Uh, whereas in an accelerator, the thing that's doing the pushing is the photons in those magnetic beams uh, that are being pushing all those particles around. So it's two different particles um, uh, with, uh, observing the same phenomenon. In the case of particle accelerators, what's being released is photons that we can see as Cherenkov radiation. But in the case of Planck star gravity wells, um, the mass quantum are doing the pushing as they approach the speed of light and the mass quantum get emitted because they can't go any faster than light. And we can't measure that. That becomes missing mass. And it's, uh, it's, it's a very good way to distinguish between these two particle types uh, as an experiment. It's one of the way to prove that the existence of mass quantum is to measure those types of phenomena. So that's our reality right now. Two particles interacting with each other in free states and bound states. The mass quantum has free state uh, halos, and it interacts with photons, causing photons to change their inertia and direction, called gravity, toward the center of a screening mass. And the photons themselves can interact with these mass quantum and uh, with other fermions uh, and leptons and uh, uh, create these, uh, these forces that we observe that move our cars and and uh, move our engines and generators and water and all those other things that we rely on uh, at a human scale, a Newtonian scale. So the theories basically have to map together to be valid, and this theory maps in at the Planck scale, uh, whereas uh, Newtonian scale is all about smoothing those interactions and making uh, assumptions that the mathematics is continuous, you get into quantum and nuclear scale, and it's all about zigzag motion between the different particles, uh, but they disappear as they get absorbed because the mathematics has no solutions when they're inside the particles. And uh, so the math for that is statistical, uh, controlled by Heisenberg uncertainties, and uh, you get these matrix mathematics that formulate with weird concepts and results uh, of alternative worlds and other junk that just gets a little bit uh, too much nonsense. So we've uh, put inserted this theory at the Planck scale, which operates the same way but doesn't use continuous mathematics, it doesn't permit zeros and infinities, and it's only point-to-point -point transitions between particle events that happen between mass quantum and photon quantum. The photon quantum always go at the speed of light between these interactions, they always slow down and cause special relativity delays as they encounter particles, and they only travel in straight lines when they're not encountering any particle. Uh, and so what I, what's out there is back in space, and they're just traveling through space. They're aware of absolute space, because the only the particles themselves can be aware of that. And then humans measure, as we try to measure and, and observe this phenomenon, we measure relative space because of the special relativity delays. Every event comes to us with a time delay, uh, as it travels across the voids of space or whatever distance it has to travel to our detectors as humans. 
and that delay, which is special relativity, causes a composite image of reality. We can never measure simultaneous images of reality. We can only measure the past summed up into the present and most recent uh, observation of the collision event. So uh, this is how this theory fits into the overall scalability of uh, how we smooth these curves out with approximating mathematics uh, as we go further and closer to the Newtonian analysis. Planck scale analysis is much more accurate and it's a super summation of the various uh, energy levels, uh, energy Lagrangians following that Planck formula. The sum of the energies is equal to h bar nu plus or minus uh, g dot uh, omega. And the omega is the angular spin velocities of the particles. Those are the energy levels. And you can super sum them as energy Lagrangians and add them to the energy Lagrangians of the quantum field theory uh, in the middle, or you can add them to the energy Lagrangians changing the form of general relativity to an energy equation, and you can make those uh, equivalents as well and calculate the numbers of particles that are required to do the interactions to get the observed um, values uh, in the experiments. The Higgs boson, of course, is our attempt to explain why there's mass. The quantum field theory doesn't have any mass built into it, and so we have to add it as the Higgs uh, parameter. Uh, it's also the Higgs Lagrangian uh, formulation. Uh, and you can see that in the equations that we'll present later. We've already gone through in the previous lecture in our existence theory to find space, you know, something beyond what we can measure, and then we can measure finite space out to 13 billion years uh, or so, and yet we can only measure that in the past because of the particle evidence of that uh, coming in as photon streams. Uh, it took 13.75 billion years or so to get to us, and it seems to be expanding rather than contracting, and that's what we call dark energy effects. And again, that's because there's nothing opposing all those mass quantum that are out there impacting the stuff from the very beginning of the universe and forcing all of the particles and all the particle interactions which send us those photons, um, those are still being forced outward with nothing to oppose them. There's nothing to hold them back. There's no other particles to uh, to cause an energy balance or a velocity balance or acceleration balance. Uh, there's just nothing there. So it expands rapidly. Uh, and yet, inside of the finite space, there's still enough homogeneous uh, mass quantum halo particles hanging around uh, that they can clump together, and then once they clump, they form screening phenomenon, and that screening creates the uh, dark matter-type uh, gravities, and they continue to clump together and clump together until they become... Uh, asteroids and then they become planets and then they become stars as they get hot enough and accumulate enough mass uh, and then the stars become supernova and the supernova uh, get collect more and decay back into more mass and eventually uh, creates a, a Planck star because the gravity is so intense and then the Planck star is uh, collected in the center of every galaxy and the galaxies collect into gigantic threads that weave across the sky Again, because of dark matter pushing all of the dark matter, mass quantum halo, pushing all these particles together into very fine threads when you observe the universe at large. And we created again this concept of antispace, which is the particle itself, antiparticles and, and particles interacting. Those are the neutron, the uh, neutrino, the electron, and the proton that we observe in stable uh, uh, states in the universe um, and the two particles that compose those par four particles of the standard model were, were making the theoretical um, uh, assumption that it's the mass quantum and photon quantum interacting in a, in a structure of composites uh, with large numbers of them combining through the effects of screening of gravity and photon inertia that hold them together. So we kind of already defined the photon, but uh, physics itself doesn't do a good job. Uh, the modern standard physics, the standard model, doesn't do a very good job of defining what a photon actually is. Uh, it's equated to a wave function, and it pulsates, and it's got two planes of electro and magnetic uh, phenomenon, and it's 
it's described as a unitary U1 uh, matrix, and, and all that stuff doesn't help you really understand why it acts like a particle. It, it tends to make you believe that it's more of a wave than it is a particle, and there's our problem with modern physics. We rely too much on that mathematics of Maxwell, uh, which basically formulated everything in terms of field theories that become waves. And uh, only Einstein was able to figure out that, no, 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 uh, that, the, that photon is actually a particle because of the photoelectric effect. And it doesn't change its frequency except through very specific changes in the uh, index of refraction. And uh, the reality of that is uh, caused by special relativity delays simply because the photon travels a longer distance from one event to the other uh, as it goes from one index of refraction to another. If we're going from atmospheric space to glass, um, it hits more uh, electrons, and in that process, it still goes at the speed of light between the electrons, but that absorption and emission process and those angles of scattering angles make it travel longer distances. So when we as humans observe that, it looks to us like the photon slows down, but it doesn't. Uh, so we calculate that index of refraction and say that it slows down, and from it slowing down, dividing through by distance, and we focus on waves, so we have to have a wavelength, so the wavelength basically must increase or decrease because of the index refraction. And we get into this, okay, wave theory phenomenon. And Einstein said, no, that's not how photoelectric effect works because the same number of photons always hit only single electrons and boost, push single electrons out. And you can't push out any more than the number of photons you have. So it's a staccato uh, photon stream hitting the electrons and knocking them out one at a time. So there's a, there's a lot of mathematics that makes these big assumptions, but the reality is one particle hits one particle and moves it around. And that's whether it's mass quantum that they're moving things around or whether it's photon quantum that they're moving things around. One particle does an interaction and it travels through space uh, longer distances between these events uh, when there is less dense uh, particle space. And when it encounters more dense particle space, it takes longer, and it looks like it slows down, but that's human relativity perspective. And that's our problem with how we observe it. So we're going to try to define the photon as you know something else because we don't know what it looks like. We don't know how big it is. Nobody knows if it even exists in the form that it really exists in. We have a mathematical statistical representation which doesn't actually describe it. It describes all the possible states that it might have. And what kind of space is it moving through? How long does it exist? Well, we know that it exists forever. The photon was created at the beginning of the universe. Uh, the, I believe that the mass quantum was created first and froze out uh, in, after the Big Bang very quickly. Uh, and then later the photon quantum came out. And then those two interacted in very, very hot particle or particle pairs. And they eventually cooled down into baryons. And those baryons eventually combined together to form the rest of the fermions of the standard model as things got cooler and cooler. And so we've got the two numbers that are, okay, well, we know the Planck scale things happen at that scale of somewhere around uh, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, and there's some density, mass density associated with that of 5.157 times 10 to the 93 grams per cubic centimeter, and that's the smallest possible thing that the mathematics will give us. And the assumption that I've made on the size of the mass quantum is that we go beyond that. And I got those uh, measurements based on trying to define the density of Planck stars relative to neutron stars, relative to uh, supernova stars, relative to Earth stars, uh, sun stars, and Earth bodies, and predicted the, how, the densities that it would take to get a uh, mass quantum uh, through that uh, and how long that would take. And so I came up with size estimates uh, for the mass quantum is somewhere around 10 to the minus 75 meters, not 10 to the minus 35 meters. Uh, so the um, sizes are much smaller, I think, than we believe they are. And the masses are so much smaller than we believe they are, somewhere around you know 10 to the minus, uh, minus 54 or whatever I calculated. And we'll show all that later. So we continue to look at the photon and what happens to it after it's absorbed by an electron. Well, the modern physics of the standard model doesn't say. It just assumes it disappears, and that's not true because it's formed in the beginning universe. 
uh, even the photons that are captured inside of the protons as in that energy equal uh, mass times uh, c squared, you can release that energy in a nuclear explosion. Well, that energy is still bound in there. Those photons are inside. Uh, they've never been released since the beginning of the particle formation that formed the proton to begin with. So, you know, there are free state photons flying around everywhere that come from fusion of the sun uh, and, and released through fusion, and there's free state mass quantum flying around everywhere. But there's also bound state mass quantum that are down inside these fermions to form their mass. And there are bound state photons interacting with the photon quantum that are bound in those uh, particles that they, uh, they form as composites. So we have to understand that there's a lot of energy in there that's been there since the beginning of the universe. And so it just gets absorbed and it changes its state. And there's... There's a mechanism by which the free state particles can become captured, and then as new free state particles slam into them, there's a release mechanism, it's kind of like an overflow concept, where it can't hold but just so many particles in, so, in a certain quantum state. In fact, there's even a theory about that uh, that uh, came up with uh, quantum states can only exist in pairs of two, and, and, and those were all done uh, uh, by calculating uh, how many states could be existing in a particular orbital. That work uh, uh, was done in the 1930s. So, again, uh, we make assumptions that they all spin. Uh, the quantum spin is a matrix mathematics, so it's, again, designed to separate fermions from bosons. Uh, but the type of spin I'm talking about is the energy level spin. It's quantized. It only exists at a certain value of angular spin velocity uh, and a discrete state. And it can't exist at any other, so there's energy buckets that uh, have existence, and there's energy buckets that don't exist. Uh, and that spin, angular spin velocity, is the variable that changes, not the speed of light. So an h dot doesn't change, and g dot doesn't change, so the only thing that can change is omega and, and nu, which are the frequencies uh, of the Planck uh, uh, Lagrangian that we've described. And exactly how does it interact with the mass to cause a change in the flight path? Well, we described that briefly. There's a screening phenomenon uh, that occurs, again, due to this uh, mass quantum halo that creates gravity, or a photon quantum halo that can create uh, force through inertia, and inertial changes. That's how your car moves, and your engines move, and your generators move, and your motors move. Uh, that's all inertial energy caused by photons in a big stream through some magnetic concept uh, streaming as individual particles to impact individual particles that are in the molecules of the machine that you're trying to move. And they're impacting with the electrons and being absorbed by the electrons and then re-emitted by the electrons. And they're also impacting with the protons, absorbing by the protons and being emitted by the protons. And that's what we call the electromagnetic force. So let's move on. We'll talk about the weak force, which is the other bosons of W plus, W minus, E not until later. And we'll again address the Higgs the bosons and gluons and bound states uh, later, uh, again, as composites of these two particles. Uh, so I don't really want to go into the depths of uh, these things, but basically we have to have some screening, uh, streaming concept of particles streaming in, individual particles coming in a pulse or, or, a, or a, a release of uh, several of them in a particle stream, and they all impact at different energy levels, and they cause, essentially they cause the photoelectric effect on anything they impact, and they get absorbed, and then they cause the particles to be ejected or vibrate or whatever else they, we show them doing, and they create temperature uh, as a consequence of transferring energy. And if they come in really, really cold, like they do with cosmic background radiation, whether it's a photon quantum, or a mass quantum, they both have cosmic background values. It's just the photon quantum is somewhere around 2 degrees Kelvin, and the mass quantum cosmic background coming in as particle streams from all corners of the universe uh, is even colder than that. It's almost zero, but not zero. And uh, so you get, in, you, know, you get spin cycles of 50 hertz, or 20 hertz, or 10 hertz, or 2 hertz, and that's incredibly cold. That's, that's as close to applet zero as you can get. So, you know, Einstein defined zero rest mass 
why did he set it to zero? Because physics shouldn't have any zeros. Uh, we think it has a, a mass, uh, some type of inertia that's inherent in it. It's just extremely small. And it always moves at a constant free state uh, velocity in space as it's ejected out of the particles that it's interacted, interacting with. It's an escape velocity. It's always the same. That's why it always travels at the same speed, because it takes the same type of phenomenon to eject it exist in both protons and electrons. There's some mechanism that's identical inside of these two particles, even though they have different masses. The mechanism of, that's binding the photon, and it's very likely the way mass quantum interact with photon and capture them in a little, you know, a little uh, rotating, counter-rotating pair, as they uh, basically get ejected again, they always come out uh, at an escape velocity of 2.997 2 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, and that's an exact value. So only the particles themselves understand that velocity constant relative to absolute space, only in their local space. They're the only particles that are aware of that speed c. When we observe those particles from a distance as human beings, we have to calculate that c as a, uh, with an understanding of there's a relativity correction that needs to occur any time we're measuring that particle traveling close to the speed of light because of the delays that occur and how long it takes the photon to get to us from one sensor to another when it's traveling near, uh, when the particles are traveling and emitting photons near the speed of light. So uh, that's how we have to apply relativity uh, because of the constant photon speed. It's always delayed as it interacts with other particles. And our information always gets to us from the past as human beings relative to a coordinate system that we assume the, where the particle was originally admitted at and the time it takes to get into the collector to give us the evidence that we've had an event that happened in the past. Um, modern physics define the standard model photon as a, as a photon boson or U1 group theory, tensor mathematics. And uh, we're not going to go into this in great detail. Uh, just want to address that if you want to go through those calculations, the photon is the U1 uh, tensor unitary uh, matrix. And then we define special unitary matrices with special properties of calculating you know, matrix math uh, as uh, special unitary threes, which is the nuclear force contribution, and the special unitary twos, uh, which is the weak uh, maybe it's the weak force. Yeah, this uh, special unitary 2 is the electron component interacting with the U1 photon component. That's your electromagnetic component, SU2 times U1 matrix math. And the SU3, I believe, is the weak theory um, that was then calculated. So the combination of those two, electromagnetic and weak theory, are brought together in unification mathematics. Um, and then you have to add the nuclear uh, uh, factors in, uh, which are a different unitary matrix, and then the Higgs uh, contribution. So these uh, eventually are formulated as, as Lagrangians. They're all energy Lagrangians, so you can sum them up. Uh, and that's the way we calculate the physics of the modern standard model. Um, I just didn't, don't need to talk about photons interacting with pi meson, bosons, Yukawa's, spin zero, digs. All those are particle spin zero because they don't spin. And the assumption is when they break down, they break down into particles of half spins and they each go one way or the other. It's always a two particle pair. And that's again mathematics driving that. It may not be the reality of physics uh, as, as nature uh, decays into the various photon quantum and mass quantum basics com particle composites. Again, I don't want to go too much into the scalar and vector matrix. Uh, you can study general relativity and quantum field theory, which is based on scalar and vector mathematics that eventually we formulate as tensors, and they create some very unusual uh, predictions and cause the quantum of zeros and infinities that we have to deal with with normalization concepts, and it's just a mess. Uh, and I don't think nature at the Planck scale is that complicated. It's, I think it's just energy Lagrangians of two particles interacting, and they change the inertia of each other, and they change the acceleration and, and the momentum of each other. And they're not aware of each other until they actually get close enough to have some interaction, uh, interaction radius.
This is uh, how you calculate scalars and vectors and do the math and, and then how you get a unitary matrix. This is the photon. Uh, that GUV is called the... Uh, uh, oh shoot, I forgot real quick. Uh, the... Uh, da, 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 da. Oh man. I should know that. It's a uh, it's an identity matrix G. It just it's slipping my mind right now for some reason. But it's very used in all quantum physics and and general relativity. And I'll think of it in a minute and pop it, it uh, into my mind what that is. But uh, it is a term. Just can't remember. It. Sorry. Maybe I wrote it down here. Um, we get uh, basically operators on these matrices uh, that let us uh, elevate them and and uh, move them up the ladder and down the ladder in terms of symbolic uh, calculations or representations. And they're all known as Hermitian matrices because of the uh, complex square matrix equal to its own conjugate transpose. That's what makes it uh, Hermitian. <clears throat> so these are special properties and they eventually uh, lie in a group of mathematics known as the Lie group of unitary matrices and special unitary Matrices are used to describe the other phenomena in quantum physics chromodynamics between quarks, gluons, protons, neutrons, and the Higgs. Gauge theory is uh, also important to uh, restrain some of the uh, transformations that are made between uh, the uh, field transforms from one, uh, one uh, uh, relative frame to another gauge theory restricts uh, how those frame transformations can occur without uh, breaking some rules. Uh, and we're looking for symmetry in the, how those uh, matrices uh, are formulated. It makes the mathematics easier and it makes our understanding of uh, modern standard model particle physics easier. Uh, but again, the experimentalists, they don't usually use all this stuff. This is the theoretical guys uh, trying to come up with answers. Uh, the particle physicists, uh, experimental physicists, they just measure buckets of energy uh, and then they super sum all that up, which is exactly what the theory that we're proposing does. So we're using a pure particle theory. Newton was the first to speculate that, and a guy named Lesage, I finally remember that name, uh, was uh, also presenting that concept of particle theory as a basis of gravity to Newton. He didn't carry it any further. Uh, than his basic gravitational uh, constant. And that was all done not through any mathematics that we recognize. It was all done through geometry. Newton used exclusively geometry to prove all of his theorems. Uh, and some of those geometries are very interesting. Uh, the geometry of how he proved that the, the 1 over r squared radius being the most important. Um, it's uh, basically a very, very small incremental type of a... Uh, of, uh, a derivative type concept uh, in geometry. But we got much more sophisticated mathematics now. So Lagrangians uh, in the quantum field theory uh, are the format that we create. Uh, if you see that Lagrangian of the QED, quantum electrodynamics, that formula is there. That 1 over 4 pi, uh, 1 over 4 mu naught 0 f u sub v, those are upper and lower indices that you can transform back and forth. Um, that's your um, that's your electromagnetic component, uh, which hasn't changed much uh, uh, since the original uh, um, formulation of it, uh, and um, I doubt it'll ever change. Even though it's 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 a classical representation turned into a uh, quantum statistical uh, Lagrangian. Newtonian gravity is represented uh, this way. Einstein gravity is represented with that uh, R minus uh, 1 over 2 factor. Uh, and again, these are all Lagrangians that get added up. That's a Ricci tensor, uh, R uh, sub U, U nu, nu U, nu. <laughs> mu nu, I think is what it is. Um, metric tensor, that's what I wanted to say, the G uh, mu nu. Okay, that's a unitary, a unit uh, identity matrix. And the metric tensor is, uh, is used to normalize and get things to be equal to one. Uh, 
and it has unique properties that uh, that uh, make it a special uh, matrix uh, to use in these formulations. It makes a lot of things become one. So uh, we theorize that everything is a wave function while it's not being measured, and when we measure it, it, it collapses into a single point after we measure it, and this is just the way the mathematics is uh, formulated in, in order to uh, get the numbers and the operators that we want for, uh, for momentum and for energy and to meet uh, Heisenberg uncertainty principles uh, where these two cannot be measured simultaneously with the same degree of accuracy. So you either can measure time and energy with time with accuracy and poor accuracy and energy or you can measure momentum with, uh, with position and accuracy or accuracy and position and not accuracy and momentum. And that's again due to Planck's constant and we have if we carried this theory out uh, to the mass quantum, you would have an uncertainty principle for a mass quantum that would also uh, make your sensor predictions have uncertainty modules. Now, it's very possible that physics itself at the Planck scale doesn't have any uncertainties. It's an absolute certainty that two particles uh, know exactly their relative momentum and they transfer that momentum and they know their exact position and they transfer that exact position as they get closer to one another um, so it's very possible that only humans need the uncertainty principle, but the particles of nature uh, don't follow that, okay? It's just when we take measurements that we as humans have to deal with relativity de delays and uncertainties in positions and momentums and uncertainties in energies and times. Uh, and again, time is a human concept. Uh, we, by human observation, the particles themselves don't really care about time, they simply care about events. It's a discrete event that happens in whatever period of uh, moving through space they go through the distance to interact and then there's another distance where they don't interact so that's all finite. It's sort of a step function. It's nothing and then bang and then nothing again. And then they go on forever never knowing about each other ever again. But their energy has been exchanged, their momentum has been exchanged, their scattering angle has been exchanged and changed, and that when you super sum all that up, all those energy levels over human time, you get a composite picture and you get a description of what looks like uh, special relativity delays of events happening at the Planck scale. And that forms our modern uh, dark energy, dark matter phenomenon, forms our modern Gravity phenomenon forms our modern inertia movement of our cars and generators. Um, again, photons and mass quantum interacting. Born interpretation is, is interesting. Uh, I don't want to go into details of why there's a born interpretation. It's also known as the Copenhagen interpretation. And it's simply because it couldn't resolve the, this collapsing wave function. Uh, or the superposition of both states at the same time, how can they exist in both states simultaneously and then collapse into one state that's measurable? Uh, and that conundrum resulted in uh, disagreements between Einstein and Born, and eventually came up with this concept called the Copenhagen interpretation, uh, and we haven't changed much from that. So uh, the problem is this assumption that that Duality state, simultaneous state, uh, it, to me it's become a fantasy that we rely on too heavily because we can't measure anything uh, that's happening before we take a measurement and so we allow this crazy mathematics to uh, drive our assumptions uh, that everything is a wave function spread out everywhere and then somehow miraculously when human beings measure it, um, it collapses into a real value. And I just think that's a mathematical phenomenon. I don't think that's what nature's really doing. It's just, I think nature is just colliding, absorbing and emitting, just like it's always done. And, and you see the evidence of that when you look at particle physics pictures. <laughs> when you watch the particles go through detectors and you watch them go through cloud chambers, it's always point particles or particle streams. And same thing with photoelectric effect. So that's why we're getting rid of waves and wave functions getting rid of the reliance on the wavelengths as a way of representing photons and, and photon energies, and we're just using frequencies. Anger, spin, velocity with a constant velocity 
linear velocity on a particle. And it solves so many of these complexities, we get a much simpler mathematics, a much simpler discrete mathematics, and we can calculate the same numbers. That's the important part. It doesn't invalidate any of the existing Born interpretation physics, it just lets you calculate the same numbers using a different technique, which is the super summation of energy Lagrangians already interpreted by Max Planck to be the sum of the energies is equal to h dot nu plus we're adding g dot omega, which is the gravity component. Different additional uh, value uh, to obtain the accuracy of gravity uh, uh, phenomena. Einstein uses tensors again in his analysis. He eventually creates a four tensor energy, uh, energy and time. He combines space and time together and basically says that space warps uh, itself in order to create gravity. And we think this is a very good, uh, you know, beautiful theory, uh, but uh, collapsing space I don't think happens. I think the particles just interact with each other and cause gravity through this screaming phenomenon. Um, and so, you, again, uh, we get the same numbers using the screening phenomenon that we would get if we calculated the uh, Einstein uh, uh, geometric uh, uh, tensor on the left and the energy tensor on the right, and then we went through and actually got numbers out of it. And the problem is what we get with Einstein is the center of all those things down at the Planck scale, when you drive it down to sizes of uh, nuclear particles, it's an infinite well. It's infinity, and so it predicts infinite wormholes in the center of the Planck stars. And we know that you know, Planck stars are solid. You know, somewhere down, even Stephen Hawking is admitting that the event horizon is just a, a, a mathematical calculation, a radius of where the, the gravity is so strong at the surface of that that you can, none of the particles can escape. They just can't get out of that gravity well. But further down in that, uh, somewhere, is a, is a solid mass of, of uh, very high energy particle uh, plasmas uh, in, at particle, any particle pairs probably at, at energies and temperatures, probably not at the Big Bang, but getting you know, hotter and hotter approaching the Big Bang kind of uh, energy level. So the um, problem with Einstein is you have to cut it off somewhere down in there. Know, the, the, at some Schwarzschild radius and you know, do a bunch of tricks and stuff to, to map it to Planck stars. And the problem is you can't use the general relativity to make any kind of quantum particle prediction. It just can't calculate single or particle events. It's just not designed to do that. So all of his assumptions are done at you know Newtonian type scales. You know, and he envisioned everything as clocks and trains and elevators, just like modern physicists do, trying to play, explain those concepts to students. And they're just confusing the crap out of every modern physics student. Like, why don't you just talk about the photon and the quantum interactions with the electrons and tell us what special relativity means at that level and what general relativity means at that level. Stop talking about trains and planes and elevators and these other analogies that aren't feasible or possible. <laughs> you know, you can't actually get a train to go at the speed of light. Come on. So We were talking previously about raising and lowering these tensor indices. Uh, you do that with, again, the, uh, the identity matrix. Uh, uh, and that's, uh, again, the, the metric tensor is used to raise and lower those. Each time you multiply, uh, you can lower an index or raise the index uh, based on how you manipulate the metric tensor. Again, this is all mathematical. If you don't like the form that it's in, change it to another form uh, in symbolic representation. And then you've got to decompose all that down into real numbers if you're going to calculate real things. So it's a very, very complex mathematics that may not be necessary uh, to explain nature as it really works. Again, that's why we have this simple... Lagrangian concept, and we can probably do Hamiltonian operators on it as well, uh, but I don't think it's necessary. Uh, as you see, the Hamiltonian operator down in the lower aspect, uh, you take away function and you operate on that with the Hamiltonian, and you get a, another format that looks like um, that format is uh, is the uh, uh, what's the guy's name that formulated it first? Schrodinger, I think, the Schrodinger equation. 
So this is, uh, we're getting more toward the modern representation of what the kinetic energy looks like of a, of a wave function and you keep on going and we're eventually going to get to uh, what, are the, what do we actually look like uh, when we measure everything in particle accelerator. Uh, and I don't think I have that representation in the slides, but basically it's a summation of the Higgs component uh, of the um, electromagnetic component, which is the, the Fermi, I think it's the, the Fermi's uh, equations that are just uh, put into tensor uh, type format. Uh, and uh, then you add the weak force component, you, and then the Yukawa nuclear uh, component, and you put in the Higgs component, and all that together forms an energy Lagrangian that you can then manipulate in matrix mathematics, raising and lowering these industries is necessary to, to get different forms so you can calculate different numbers. And uh, it takes you 10 years to learn how to do that. <laughs> For most people, you have to become a very dedicated physicist to be able to actually crank out numbers. And I think that's why physicists go into the experimental field because they, unless they love mathematics, the theory is just so difficult and tedious to work with and you just can't get any real hard answers uh, that really don't predict and we're constantly finding out that the mathematics is insufficient or wrong as we find new phenomena like dark energy and dark matter and, and um, how to handle Cherenkov radiation and the Casimir effect is another interesting one. And that Casimir effect is just you know, two big plates and why they be pushed together in empty space and again it's because the source uh, um, uh, particles inside are not as many as the source particles outside and uh, the mass quantum comes slamming into plates from both sides and and uh, they push them together uh, and it drifts in space uh, uh, just like uh, you know with no gravity because the forces are balanced on both sides except for the, the space in between and that's why the very tiny particles move very small uh, inertial increments until the plates come closer and closer together and in free space that's that's the Casimir effect and the photons can do the same thing uh, as the mass quantum will do to Casimir so and yet uh, it's an enigma in the talking about quantum vacuums uh, being the driver of why those two plates come together. And I don't think quantum vacuums exist in the form that we call them. Getting uh, energy or Higgs particle coming from nothing into something. I just don't think that's the right approach. These particles already exist. They exist at the beginning of the universe. They interact with each other and it causes the observed phenomenon that we have of gravity uh, and inertia and momentum. And, um, it's probably just that simple at the Planck scale. So we defined mass previously in our previous video as a particle that's rotating uh, at this uh, value omega. And you can sum up the number of these particles interacting uh, to get an energy equivalent. Uh, and that, you know, space is on the outside. Any space is the particle itself as it's formed and created at the Big Bang. It's indestructible. Uh, the particles of the, the form the quarks and the man and the uh, other composite particles of the of the um, standard model are pretty much indestructible unless you unless you uh, impact two photons protons together and you blow them apart at extremely high energy levels of trillions of EVs and and you blow them apart into their base parts and you measure those parts but they still come back together if they're quarks and they still blow into photon quantum and, and they become transitioned from Higgs particles to electrons and neutrinos and, and, and the higher particles that we measure, the leptons, uh, you know, the tau neutrinos uh, uh, and the mu neutrinos, those are just higher mass versions of the lower mass electrons and positrons being the particle and particle pair for the electron. And you get the same phenomenon with the the bosons and fermions that are uh, coming out of the big proton chunks. So what we're really doing is we blow stuff apart into big chunks, and yet those big chunks can't get resolved because we can't. We'd have to blow the big chunks apart into smaller chunks, and the smaller chunks blow apart into smaller chunks, and eventually we get down to the basic uh, composite particles, and we probably would find 
that all that's left is photon quantum and, and this very, very tiny mass quantum if we split it apart. Um, and that's the kind of phenomenon this theory, this theory is trying to drive toward. So we're not going to go into the standard model fermions again, talking about the half energy spin. It's just a way to separate fermions from bosons. And chirality is something you need to understand that neutrons uh, have uh, this chirality effect or helicity for relativistic uh, wave functions. Those are wave functions, that little upside down W thing. And um, they have uh, parity and, and chirality, which means they only spin in left hand spins only. And that's phenomenon of neutrinos. Uh, and it's called broken symmetry because the symmetry was that there was always a left hand and a right hand spin until we discovered the neutrinos don't do that. And even more of an enigma is we've discovered there are three different neutrinos with different masses and quantum field theory doesn't predict that. So the existing equations uh, are not good enough to describe the reality of neutrinos. So uh, our formulation says it's easy to have, you know, three different masses of neutrinos. It just add more composite particles. There's uh, less mass quantum in the lower state and there's more mass quantum hanging together in the higher state, and they can go back and forth with each other, and combine and recombine, um, as long as there is a mass quantum that can interact with them. And, um, uh, you know, it's not that hard to have these tiny little composite particles have different masses, because there's different numbers of mass quantum involved. So, this theory doesn't have a problem with neutrinos that have different masses. But quantum field theory does. The existing format of the standard model doesn't, doesn't handle that. So, uh, let's see, we're starting to get, yeah, to the actual, uh, the full description of the kinetic energy wave function. Let's see if I can, now we're going to get through general relativity. I don't want to go through that because that's a previous lecture. Uh, the basic particles are there, they exchange energies, uh, the different bonding at the chemical level between the molecules is either ionic or covalent, that's something you learn in chemistry. And what's happening down at the uh, surface levels is uh, your photons are going between electrons and the electrons don't move very much, uh, they, people believe electrons go down wires, that's not true, they simply go between one molecule and another uh, transitioning into free state due to the photoelectric effect and what travels at the speed of light is the photon itself and it can leave that wire and become radio wave okay just, just streams out from the center of wires whereas it can't do that in an optical fiber cable because of the mirror it just keeps bouncing off the the, the mirror inside the uh, inside the quartz uh, filament so photons have things they can get through and things they can't get through very easily. Uh, Feynman, Richard Feynman diagrams are quite often used to describe these interactions between say gamma radiation and electrons uh, again being the electromagnetic force of chemistry. Uh, collisions of antiparticles uh, are used to explain the energy equal mc squared equation. You can convert all that mass to photons. Uh, in the right environment you can you can squeeze together all the photons and create mass again. That's the Big Bang kind of stuff. So uh, it takes energies to do that that are beyond our modern accelerators in many cases. We can, we can cause antiparticles, but then they typically what we call annihilate into pure photons, and they're just changing state from the bound state of mass quantum photon interaction. Uh, spinning in one direction, they're positrons. Spinning in the other direction, they're electrons. And then when the energy levels get high enough, when they combine, uh, photons get released uh, and mass gets converted at high enough energy levels uh, and you get a nuclear uh, decay, radioactive decay out of that. Just an emphasis, magnetic field is not magical, it's not really a field. Field is just a mathematical concept with a zero in the center and it doesn't have any value until you add a, a magnitude on it. It's just a way of calculating with a bunch of particles spread symmetrically through space. That's the problem with fields, is everything has to be symmetrical. Whereas with just scattered photons and particles everywhere, there's sort of a random halo event to this. And the magnetic field is the photons. The photons are flying everywhere, and they create a phenomenon known as magnetism as they spin and move relative to uh, an electron. And they also create a similar field when they move relative to a proton. 
and then the proton absorbs them and the electron absorbs them and and that causes the proton and electron to move together that's the electron electromagnetic force pulling uh, negative particles toward positive particles and positrons get pulled toward electrons and annihilate into pure protons when that happens at high enough energy levels the key here is that it doesn't disappear the photon is indestructible as is the mass quantum they just get into a bound state. That's why we say there's two free states, a free state, free state for photon quantum, a free state for mass quantum, and then they both have bound states where they get captured and held inside of, of uh, composite particles that are already formed at the beginning of the universe, the neutrons, the protons, the electrons, and the neutrinos. And they can move in and out of those based on some mechanism that is the same that causes them to always be ejected at the speed of light. That mechanism uh, we haven't yet described. I don't know what it is, but I believe it's some type of an interaction between the mass quantum circulating around the photon quantum, and they're trapped together in some type of a, of a, a composite orbital. Uh, and then something else adds more energy to that, and one or both of those particles fly out of that state of capture. Uh, whereas the majority of them stay there and have been there since the beginning of the universe until you subject them to high enough temperatures and energies that they basically convert pure mass to pure energy. Pure, pure, all the fermions that are bound with the uh, bound state uh, mass quantum in them get uh, disturbed with enough energy that they lose their ability to be held together and they go flying out as missing mass or free state mass quantum that we can't detect and flying out in a huge gamma radiation level energy photons that are spinning uh, with angry spin velocities in the gamma spectrum of frequency and uh, do a lot of destruction in neutron stars and Planck stars uh, with these photon gamma beams. Standard model, again, uh, just a picture of you know, the SU2 special unitary matrix 2, the electron and special unitary matrix 3, which is the nucleus uh, nuclear forces holding the proton and neutron together. These are their masses. Uh, I might hold this up here just for a minute so you can understand the relative masses of that. And uh, what I'd like for you to see is the estimate I've made of, of, the, of the existing mass quantum that we're postulating in this theory is 7.37261954 times 10 to the minus 51 kilograms. So much smaller than any of these other particles you know, by magnitudes, uh, you know, and um, that's why they're able to move through stuff so easily without interacting. That's why there's billions of them as halos that can move all these other particles around, including the photon, which has no mass, but we think that that number is also very small, something, you know, of the same order, or maybe even smaller, or slightly bigger, 10 to the minus 40, or you know, 10 to the minus 60, probably somewhere in that range of its actual mass. Uh, again, none of that's measurable. That's why Einstein said it's rest mass of zero. Nobody's disagreed with that. You know, it's sort of set as a set point. But the problem is zero violates our concept that nothing real is zero. And nothing real is infinite. It has to have a finite value. So that restriction is basically our sensors are limited. We just can't detect that size, that very small inertia of mass of a photon, but it, we firmly believe that it's there, and it's somewhere between the mass of the electron and the mass of that mass quantum. Pretty sure that it's it's in one of those numbers, 10 to the minus 40 or 10 to the minus 60, I'm not sure. Uh, even the quarks have been measured now, and the neutrinos, as I said before, have three masses, and we didn't know they did, but the, the the mu electron and the mu neutrino, the neutrino and the antineutrino, they had measurable masses, but then the, the mu electron and the mu tau electrons, they have their accompanying weak uh, force equivalents of the mu neutrino and the mu antineutrino, uh, and, and that mass has been measured uh, through the Snow Lab observatory um, experiments that I went to as a, as a summer conference one time and, pre and presented these ideas to most of the experimental physicists there, and they were just wild by it. They, they really liked it this mathematical approach that I presented is, is very likely because uh, they tend to not trust the theoretical physicists because they don't use any 
you know, they're not searching for real data a lot of times, they're just speculating, and these experimental physicists, they don't believe anything until they can measure it, you know, so it's a, it's a split between philosophies, what's real, what's fantasy. And then the tall neutrino uh, has different masses as well that have been measured. Uh, in fact, the gentleman who runs the snow lab up there, I think, got a Nobel Prize uh, for that discovery of three different mass states for neutrinos streaming in from the sun. And uh, so I think that's enough on uh, this particular page. So the standard model, um, the gauge groups, SU3, gauge couplings, uh, those are all the up quarks, down quarks, charm quark, strange quark, top quark, and bottom quark. And they have three colors, and they have another three... Um, not colors, but the, what's the term? Um, anyway, it's another three groupings that we use in addition to colors. Uh, flavors, I think, is what they use. So, And the bosons are what bind all that stuff together. They're the force exchange particles, one of which is the photon quantum. And then I think there's different versions of photons that just have more mass, and we're calling those gluons, and we're calling them W pluses, W minus, and Z neutrals, and I think they actually have behavior similar to photons. They just they they have more mass quantum in them as a composite somewhere. They're combining photon quantums and mass quantum to form these other types of gluons with gluon behavior, and other types of bosons. They're all bosons uh, with W plus, W minus, and Z naught behaviors in the weak force interaction. So again, our theory is that all these quarks are composed of composites of tiny little groups of mass quantum that are in bound states, uh, and they can interact with free states, and that interaction causes gravity. We got quantum chromodynamics with the Yukawa part. Remember, I tell you this is a that's the Fer, uh, Fermi part that minus one fourth F U V F I V U V. And then the right side is Yukawa's uh, contribution to the strong force model. So this, that's the electromagnetic side of the interaction on the left part of that equation. Uh, that's the photons interacting with the protons uh, at the nuclear level, strong force level, and the quarks at the, at the strong force level. And then this extra Yukawa, Yukawa component formulated uh, as a, as a uh, Lagrangian uh, uh, tensor mathematics. Uh, Gilman was the first to basically uh, break uh, these models apart into eight different groups uh, of uh, flavors and quarks, uh, flavors and uh, colors, uh, grouping of how the quarks uh, combine to make uh, protons and neutrons. A proton is a two up quarks and a down quark, I think, and a neutron is two down quarks and an up quark. Uh, and they're all in pairs of three, and Gelman is the first to figure that uh, matrix mathematics out and groupings. And then the poly matrices were used to understand spins. Uh, Wolfgang Pauli was the one that uh, first uh, uh, predicted these spin phenomenons uh, and how they calculated it. So, and uh, divide them into either fermions or bosons uh, based on their spin quantized matrix mathematics spin number. Again, that's not the angular spin velocity that we're talking about that real particles have with real energy levels being quantized. The spin is the quantized numerical value times uh, its, it's uh, uh, Planck constant particle, which is a constant, or its gravity uh, mass quantum value g dot in that uh, Planck scale energy Lagrangian equation. And you can equate this LSU3 equation on the right-hand side, you can put that uh, Planck scale energy Lagrangian on the left. Sum of the energies is equal to um, equal to H dot uh, nu plus or minus uh, G dot uh, uh, omega on the left and sum that, super sum that up to get the same number on the left side of energy that you get on the right side of energy. So that phenomenon is, is uh, possible if you convert uh, that Planck scale energy Lagrangian in, into a tensor mathematics on the left-hand side to equal every tensor value on the right-hand side. Uh, so the mathematics is supersummed on the balance of energies on both sides to be the same calculatable energies. And you do the same thing with gravity equations and general relativity 
energy tensors or the Einstein tensor tensor on the left, which is tells it how to move, and the energy tensor uh, describes uh, the, the strength of it. So I believe that's how that works. Uh, sort of a visual picture of what a W plus uh, boson interacting with uh, proton and electron might look like, but no electron and neutrino. Um, trying to visualize a lot of this stuff, and then quantum. Chromodynamics uh, octet again. This is Gelman's uh, contribution uh, where the proton and neutron sit relative to the other higher particles that are just bigger chunks that we knock off the proton and the neutron, and the big chunks that get combined together. And they don't last very long, you know, nanoseconds in an accelerator, and they collapse right back down into one of the other four stabilized particles. But we can measure those energy levels um, as they go through the detector, and we call them different particles, but they're they're really just got a bunch of extra mass quantum and a bunch of extra photon quantum uh, in these big chunks uh, that give different energy levels, and we measure those energy levels and call them different particles. Um, but they're just, I think they're just composites of the same mass quantum, photon quantum uh, structures, composite structures that just decay into some stable form of that. And the others just have more of it, but unstable uh, structures. Or QCD diagrams. Again, these are the spins, the relative spins, uh, flavors, and uh, colors that give a one third spin, two third spin, and combine them together to make one. They all have to equal one at some point. Uh, up quark, down quark, balance to equal one. Two up quarks and a down quark equals one in terms of their spins, and uh, two down quarks and an up quark equals one in terms of their spins. Uh, so it's just, it's a and calculating technique. And this is again the, Del the Gelman structure for quark couplets, the SU3 nuclear phenomenon uh, in terms of the special unitary matrix is how you calculate the, the energies of these things. But you've got on the top of the stack uh, uh, an omega particle and it's again the, how do these quarks temporarily combine because something is slamming them together. Well that something is the mass quantum the big halo of mass quantum outside and the big halo of photon quantum outside of this particle slamming them back together and holding them together it's this tiny small Planck scale uh, distances at which they're interacting so they can interact temporarily but they're unstable so this omega particle is formed of three um, negative strange particles all together and then you've got your psi meson that is a uh, is is a pion uh, pi meson combined with two strange particle quarks. You know, so you, you just keep going through the mathematics of what a kion is. Is again two 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 quarks, um, either strange or uh, charm or whatever. You know, so there's a whole bunch of these based on which the mass of that quark is. And again, I think that quark is just bigger and heavier because it's just got more mass quantum in it. Um, and again, in a composite structure that we can't measure yet and can't break apart. Uh, we just get big chunks in the, in the accelerator uh, that are stable enough to measure, and then they eventually decay and throw out those missing mass quantum as they decay. Since we can't measure this mass quantum, it just looks like it decays back to a standard model particle. But what... What happened to the missing mass? Where'd it go? Well, it's the free state mass quantum flying out because it's unstable. And some of that is the free state mass quantum uh, flying out and in addition to free state photon quantum flying out. And we can see that. That we see as an energy release uh, in our detectors, but we're not measuring the rest of it, all that missing mass as these things decay. Thus, the reason for inventing the Higgs particle as a means of explaining that. But I don't think the Higgs particle is, is uh, anything other than a mathematical representation of how these particles can combine and decay as quarks into stable particles, uh, electrons and neutrinos, typically. The weak force model uh, is a, another equation that gets added to this overall uh, force. The weak force is your radioactive forces, uh, basically... Uh, Neutrons decay into electrons and neutrinos, and the weak force carriers, W plus and bosons, W plus, W minus, and Z neutral, are the force carriers between them, and they're just 
again, heavier forms of photon quantum, I believe, combined with mass quantum in a, in a composite, transferring energy and mass back and forth. The Lorentz force contribution, I said it was Fermi, I'm sorry, it's Lorentz, I forgot who uh, created that gauge form of that, but see that gauge form, the weak force model, the minus one quarter F uh, UV, F plus whatever the, in the tensor ladder, um, that's been used to describe, you know, generator and magnetic uh, interaction phenomenon ever since Lorentz came up with it, you know, back in the 30s or so, maybe even sooner than that. And then you add the rest of the components, so the Yukawa, Lagrangian, the, uh, the um, I don't recognize it, the gauge uh, phenomenon, uh, and add them all up uh, to get that special unitary 2 times unitary 1, it gives you the weak force model. SU2 times U1. I thought that was electromagnetic, but maybe not. Maybe it's a U1 times U1. I'm not sure. I've got to go look that up again. Uh, sometimes forget which is the weak force and which is the electromagnetic force representation. This says, I believe that this is the electromagnetic force representation, special unitary times unitary 1. The unitary 1 is definitely the photon uh, tensor, but um, SU2, I want to say, is the electron combination of that, but and then weak force should have SU3, but maybe not. We'll see. Could be wrong. Have to correct that later. And SU3 could be the nuclear uh, version of it. Again, we've spent too much time on the weak force, but this is how radiation decay happens as a diagram. There's a Feynman diagram of that. Neutral force carrier. The W plus or the W minus. Uh, it depends on the direction they go and the whether they create neutrinos or antineutrinos or positrons or electrons is reasons for the different uh, gluon charge signs. And again, I believe these gluons are just photons with bound with additional mass quantum that have, have mass. And they behave like photons even as they're coupled with mass quantum. This ugly thing is my attempt to explain the streaming of these photon particles between each other. Uh, it's sort of a bad representation of particle streaming. I need to revise that. But basically, a pi meson is formed and travels between these two particles, probably the proton and the electron. And here we come backwards in time to Maxwell's equations representing these force fields and breaking it down into four basic uh, formulas, the Coulomb's Law, Ampere's Law, Faraday's Law, and then the uh, mag magnetic contribution, uh, beta there is zero. Um, this is old physics, classical physics, Newtonian physics, um, but it's used for those things that are appropriate, the human scale antennas and human scale uh, machines and things that, where we don't need the accuracy of quantum field theory. Quantum field theory is only necessary when we're dealing with particle, particle interaction and usually in particle accelerations, accelerators or cosmic type things that we're measuring in telescopes. And the rest of the human beings pretty much can get by with Maxwell's representations because they're accurate enough. They're not an accurate representation, but it's a good enough approximation of the phenomena that we observe in motion every day. The four basic particles of the standard model. Neutrin neutrons can convert to protons when they release neutrinos and electrons in doing so. And protons, when you get hit and combined by neutrinos and electrons, can form neutrons. So, this is reversible processes if you add and take away different energy levels. And in, in the middle of that is uh, missing masses that come out of it, and in addition are uh, observable photon energy levels that come out of some of these interactions. So the, the uh, energy is what it takes to uh, transition these things from one state to another. High mesons, W plus interaction. So photoelectric effect, again, is Einstein's concept that the photons travel down the wire or hit a semiconductor and they knock the electrons out. The electrons don't travel very far. They just get reabsorbed into another molecule and they go back and forth and vibrate, travel a very short distance, 
and, and they don't travel at the speed of light. The electrons never travel at the speed of light, and they never travel from one end of the battery pole to the other. It just shifts. It's like a shifting register. Eventually, you get a charge on the accumulation on the negative terminal, and you get an excess of holes on the positive terminal, um, and the real thing that's going back and forth uh, that causes the current is the photons. Photons are going down that wire or through that um, uh, fluid or semiconductor or lithium paste. That's all photons traveling from electron to electron, proton to proton, and back and forth. Um, everything is photon quantum driven, except for gravity, and that's mass quantum. We define the Higgs boson. This is the interesting thing: as a top quark, bottom quark uh, pair that come uh, at a certain energy level, and it decays into other particles. I uh, uh, can't read it, but uh, Higgs bosons uh, decay to the W plus, W minus, uh, top and bottom quarks, and then the various uh, neutrinos and either positrons or electrons. So they all decay in the various decay pairs, and there's you know multiple representations of those at uh, the Large Hadron Collider, and just a huge number of combinations of how this big chunk known as a Higgs particle then eventually decays into these other smaller composite particles, which says that the Higgs particle is formed of basic particles, and all we do is we break up the, the quarks, the top and bottom, into additional particles, the mass quantum and photon quantum interacting, and the same thing with the electron and positron. Same thing with the neutron. They've just got different numbers of the mass quantum inside that form their mass and uh, different numbers of photon quantum that form the binding energy is necessary or the force carrier energy is necessary to hold them together. So uh, just can't measure them. The sensors aren't good enough yet to detect, uh, detect these particles. And so we try to create these symmetry theories, uh, mathematics or gauge invariance that's broken to describe Primarily why neutrinos are only left-handed. Uh, broken symmetry is what was used to, uh, to save the quantum field theory uh, because it was shocked when they found out that neutrinos only had left-spinning uh, phenomenon as they went through the detectors. And how we resolve that gauge invariance. And then uh, you can always form Gauss's law out of a Newtonian concept, and the Gauss's law becomes a basis for a lot of string theories, the super string theories, and super summation is our approach to it, uh, adding up all the energy Lagrangians uh, over space can look like a one over R squared curve, but it's not. It's just zigzagging particles all over the universe, transferring their mass and momentum and energy levels and creating accelerations and velocity displacements in small increments. So um, these again are continuous wave function concepts um, and our mathematics is not continuous wave function, it is a discrete mathematics that's just simply super summing energy Lagrangian constants and frequencies. I think we can measure a bunch of this uh, with real experiments. We just have to uh, try to figure out how to uh, create perceived positions uh, from special relativity delays to, to actual positions uh, where these detectors travel over a long period of time and go through uh, gravity um, interactions, again, mass quantum causing those curvatures uh, till we hit the Earth and we discover them with a detector. And basically, some kind of a time delay, I think, is going to be necessary between a supernova interacting with something that we know is a neutron star interaction that then sends a stream of particles uh, immediately versus a delayed set of same particles with similar properties that we can somehow resolve into their individual behaviors of how mass, mass quantum create both of these phenomena. So I think experiments. Uh, through telescopes, maybe James Webb Telescope will be a uh, discovery for mass quantum interactions uh, that are originating at the beginning of the universe. I uh, hope so, that those energy levels are high enough. They come to us with cosmic background energy levels that the James Webb Telescope can measure um, and that they become something hot enough for us to measure instead of the cold stuff that we get uh, that's been traveling for 13.7 billion years that our current detectors can detect. So maybe James Webb will pick up 
is really cold heat signature because it is an IR camera system and uh, maybe or maybe not <laughs> because IR doesn't go down to sub radio which is typically the frequencies of the uh, mass quantum cosmic background radiation this has been traveling so long and slowed down by so uh, so much time so we uh, did a bunch of papers on going beyond the standard model with general relativity uh, and I'm not going to go through this a whole lot but we tried to describe space and anti-space concepts how you get mass quantum the collisions involved the spectral lines involved sizes it's basically a repeat of stuff we've already said on we tried to form a mathematics or discrete mathematics for how we describe all of that and uh, that attempt is maybe not rigorous but it's our best attempt of uh, how do you get uh, discontinuities and how do you do super summations of uh, the Lagrangian energies and how does that relate to the, the particle sizes uh, and its emissions that we can detect uh, which are either photon quantum free state photon quantum or free state mass quantum and uh, try to formulate <coughs> that into a, a screening type of a, of a uh, theory where they clump together and the clumps get big enough, uh, they absorb and screen the free state stuff so that there's an imbalance between the halo that's coming from the rest of the universe and the particles that get through the stuff that's uh, been clumped together like asteroids or Earths or even tiny particles like this are uh, going to absorb a certain amount of these and will cause motions toward the center of that composite mass due to the screening itself and the imbalance and the inertias of the mass quantum hitting from all directions versus the mass quantum coming uh, from the direction of the, uh, of the, of the fused mass, uh, clumped together mass like the Earth. And that's gravity. And we just basically do our best to try to describe a free state of that and bound state of those two different phenomena. And this is our representation of how these mass quantum create gravity. This is the Casimir plate effect uh, at small scales and why those plates come together. And we tried to put that into a series of surface uh, integrals as a way to try to represent it, but we never got to analyzing those A, B, C, D constants, what those, what those would be. But they're basically energy Lagrangian summations uh, integrated. I don't like using the integration now because it's a discrete mathematics. And how do you do integrations on discrete math other than just sum it up, supersum it? So that's why we call it supersumming. It's supersum discrete mathematics, not integration. Uh, but it's, it works. Supercomputers can do that. And I'm going to just blow through these. These are how the particles transition from one state to another as they transition from a free state into a bound state and that would be an electron absorbing a photon or an electron absorbing a mass quantum and then re-emitting it at some point. And the big issue is Niels Bohr and Heisenberg had arguments over what are these instantaneous jumps and they all led to the Heisenberg uncertainty principles because they couldn't figure out what could possibly cause something to be so discontinuous. And the reality is there's some kind of a slowdown and some kind of a escape velocity that we can't measure in the middle of that. And that mechanism's always the same. It always squeezes a photon quantum and mass quantum out at the same velocity C, constant velocity. So they slow down the same way. They speed up the same way. They get ejected when new energies uh, get injected into the system. And yet that mechanism's always the same. And it looks like a discontinuity or a jump in the orbitals. Um, and the big reason they did this was because they couldn't resolve the uh, parallel um, uh, stereoscopic lines that happened uh, when, uh, when light basically split into two equivalents uh, with black lines. And they, you know, they, they, it's, the, it's the dilemma that they dealt with in how to handle these, uh, um, these spectral lines that, that had dual splits. I can't remember the name of that phenomenon, but I will. That's the whole purpose of their initial creation of matrix mathematics and uncertainty principle to start with, was to resolve uh, those fine, they're called fine, fine re resolutions, fine, fine lines, whatever. 
Maybe I'll have a picture of that later. Okay. Uh, we've already gone through existence theorem. I'm not going to do that here. We've decided to describe how things collapse and then explode again. I'm not going to do that here. We'll do that in a different lecture. Uh, this is another view of the gravitational mechanism, another view of the different mathematics. You know, we've just added and done the best we can to get a description of these things in, in uh, different times and different views and different manuscript approaches to describing it. So this will be the end of the lecture. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, I'm sorry it's such a long lecture, but there's a lot to cover. And uh, the next series of lectures I think what we do would be much shorter and more focused on specific things. I just wanted to get the gravity concepts out there in a long lecture and then the quantum field theory concepts in a long lecture where we're again saying the same mechanism uh, drives both of them at the Planck scale. It's a photon quantum is interacting with mass quantum and they got four states, two free, free states and two bound states. And, and they use Planck's constants uh, Lagrangians from there uh, as a way of supersumming the energy levels. Uh, fairly simple theory, but I think that's what Planck uh, scale physics is. It's a very simple CAE collision absorption emission process where all the values are finite, the energy levels are quantized, and they all can be supersummed to equal the modern measurable values of energies, um, momentums, velocities, and accelerations. Hope you enjoyed it. Take care.